33 to 35. We encourage you to find those uh, in your uh, in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, we'll have these verses on the screen. But I want you to stand with me, follow along as I read these verses to you. This is the Lord speaking. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And then a few verses down, verse 33, Thus says the Lord God, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited, and the waste places shall be rebuilt, and the land that was desolate shall be tilled instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And they will say, this land was desolate, that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. We've just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And I hope you see in these verses, particularly that first section, the I wills, when we pointed that out to you in the past, when you see this God saying, I will, I will, I will, what is that? What are we seeing there? That is God speaking his covenant faithfulness, his covenant promises. And you'll notice when God says, I will, it's unilateral. He's not saying, I will if you will. These are promises he gave to Abraham. It will happen because he's tied his name to it. And so this, this becomes the part of the reason that, that Ezekiel moves from, from the picture, the specter of condemnation uh, to, the, to the hope of restoration. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Ezekiel prophesies among the Jewish exiles in Babylon uh, during the last days of Judah's decline and downfall. His ministry is in some ways similar to that of, of his older contemporary, and we're going to see in a little while, we're going to look at kind of a timeline and see who was how old in terms of, in terms of uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Jeremiah uh, was a contemporary, but an older one. Jeremiah delivered the, the warning of the coming destruction in Jerusalem. Ezekiel brings the, the sort of the backside of that, even though he gives the warning, and the, they're in Babylon, so they know that, that the captivity has come to pass, uh, and there's going to be a real heart-wrenching time where they get word that Jerusalem has been completely sacked, and it will destroy some hopes. But, but Ezekiel brings this message of reconstruction, and he brings it to the captivities in Babylon. Someone compared this. I thought that they said, Jeremiah is a man of tears. Ezekiel is a man of vision. And these visions of Ezekiel, and you're going to see he's kind of an unusual fellow. You'll pick this up particularly in the videos we show here in a minute. <clears throat> they stretch from pictures of horror to pictures of hope. From condemnation upon Judah's leaders who proved to be faithless and, and, and idolatrous to the godless foes of Babylon particularly. It goes to consolation regarding the future of Judah. You can imagine in captivity, they had reason to wonder, do we have a future? Is this the indication that God has ultimately abandoned us? And yet, Ezekiel will be the mouthpiece of God to bring hope to that. And through it all, the glory of God would be displayed. Israel's sovereign God. Until, as Ezekiel 6.10, God says in there, and they shall know that I am the Lord. All right? So let's watch uh, these two, uh, there's two, part, part, part one, part two, about seven and a half minutes each, videos uh, that give us a summary of Ezekiel. If you're not familiar with these, this is, you can find these on YouTube under the, the description, The Bible Project. Yeah, The Bible Project, and then whatever book of the Bible you're looking for. And these guys have done some excellent videos, so let's watch these together. The book of the prophet Ezekiel 
Ezekiel was a priest who had been living in Jerusalem during the first Babylonian attack on the city. And they spared the city, but they took a first wave of Israelite prisoners and hauled them off into exile, and Ezekiel was among them. So the book begins five years after all that, and Ezekiel is sitting on the bank of an irrigation canal near his Israelite refugee camp, and it's his 30th birthday, no less, the year that he would have been installed as a priest in Jerusalem. And then all of a sudden, Ezekiel has this vision. He sees a storm cloud approaching, and then inside the cloud are four strange creatures that have wings outstretched and touching each other. And these creatures each had four faces. And then he saw four wheels, one by each creature. And then he saw that the wings of the creatures were supporting this dazzling platform. And then on that platform is a throne. And then sitting on that throne is this human-like creature glowing and shrouded in fire. And then all of a sudden Ezekiel realizes what he's seeing. He calls it the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. It's God riding his royal throne chariot. Now the word glory, in Hebrew it's kavod, it means heavy or significant. The biblical authors use this word to describe the physical appearance and manifestation of God's significance when he shows up in person. These images in the vision, they're very similar to what happened when God appeared on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. And it's also very similar to the depictions of God's presence over the Ark of the Covenant. And that's actually the most shocking thing about Ezekiel's vision. What is God's glory doing in Babylon? It's supposed to be above the Ark of the Covenant in the temple in Jerusalem. And so the first section of the book opens to explore that question as Ezekiel begins to accuse Israel of rebellion. So God first speaks to Ezekiel from the throne chariot and he commissions him as a prophet. Ezekiel is to accuse Israel of breaking their covenant agreement with God in a couple ways. Israel has given their allegiance to other gods and has been worshiping idols and this has all led to rampant social injustice and violence. And so as a result, God appoints Ezekiel to warn the people. The first Babylonian attack that took Ezekiel into exile is going to be matched by another and Jerusalem, its temple, all face imminent destruction. So Ezekiel uses words and more to get his message across. He also performs sign acts. These were a form of street theater. Ezekiel would go out in public and start behaving in these really bizarre ways that were like parables of his prophetic message. So he was supposed to build a tiny model of Jerusalem and then stage an attack on it. Or he was to shave off all of his hair and then chop it up with a sword. Or the most extreme, he was to play the role of the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. And he would lay on his side for over a year eating food cooked over poop as a sign of the nasty food that people will have to eat during the siege of Jerusalem. And perhaps the most disheartening thing of all is the bad news God gave Ezekiel that no one was going to listen to him. Israel would reject him because of their rebellious and hard heart. And this recalls Moses' description of the people after the wilderness rebellions, when he predicted that exile would one day happen, and Ezekiel had the unfortunate privilege of seeing it all come to pass. And so a dismayed Ezekiel, he begins to perform his task. And after about a year, he has another vision. This one is about the temple. He goes on this virtual tour of the temple and he sees what's happening there in his absence and it is not good. In the outer courtyard in front of the temple, he sees this large idol statue. And then he sees the elders of Israel worshiping other gods, both outside and inside the temple. And then he sees the women of Israel. They're worshiping a Babylonian god named Tammuz. And the vision ends with God's glorious throne chariot moving up and away from the temple. It's leaving, going east, headed towards Babylon. And so in chapter 11, we come to see why and how God's glory appeared to Ezekiel there in Babylon. Israel's idolatry and their covenant violations, it's become so blatant and offensive that God has left his temple. They've driven him away and he consigns it to destruction. But God hasn't abandoned his people. Rather, he goes into exile with them. And so at the end of this vision in chapter 11, God promises that he will return a remnant of Israel back to the land and he'll transform them by removing their heart of stone and giving them a new soft heart of flesh so that they can love and truly follow their God after all. This is a small glimmer of hope and it's quickly submerged under the reality of the imminent destruction. But chapter 11, it's a key transition and it helps us understand 
understand how the rest of the book has been designed. So the next three sections are all announcements of God's judgment, first on Israel, then on the nations around Israel, and then on Jerusalem itself. But then after that, the hopeful conclusion of chapter 11 gets developed in the final three sections of the book. First hope for Israel, then for the nations, and then for all creation. Chapters 12 through 24 focus on God's judgment coming to Israel. And this is a diverse collection of poems and essays. And here Ezekiel shows his fondness for parable and allegory. So he depicts Israel as a burnt, useless stick or as a rebellious wife, or as a dangerous, raging lion that gets captured, or as two promiscuous sisters. These are all depictions of Israel's senseless rebellion and idolatry that results in their ruin. In this section, Ezekiel also acts like a lawyer. He begins arguing the case that, first of all, Jerusalem's destruction is truly deserved after centuries of covenant violation. And that even if the most righteous people in the world, like Noah or Daniel or Job, were alive and praying for God to spare Israel, God would not accept their prayers. It's far too late. And so God's goodness actually demands that he bring justice on this generation of Israel. The exile has become inevitable. They've reached the point of no return. Following this, Ezekiel focuses first on the nations immediately around Israel, and then on the two most powerful states in the region, Egypt and then Tyre. Israel has allied with these nations and adopted their gods and their idols. And so God accuses the kings of Tyre and Egypt for arrogantly viewing themselves as gods who get to define right and wrong on their own terms. And God holds these kings accountable for their pride and he announces that he will use Babylon to bring them down. They will face God's justice along with everybody else. Following these really intense sections is a short story in chapter 33. Ezekiel's met by a refugee who's just arrived from Jerusalem, and he gives them the report that Babylon has attacked the city of Jerusalem, that the city has fallen, and the temple is destroyed. Ezekiel's grim warnings have become a reality. But remember, the end of chapter 11, that's not the end of the story. And so in the next video, we'll explore Ezekiel's profound vision of hope. But for now, that's the first half of the book of Ezekiel. The book of the prophet Ezekiel. In the first video, we were introduced to Ezekiel the priest, and he's sitting among the exiles in Babylon. And he's confronted by the awesome glory of God's temple presence, but it's appearing to him in Babylon. And then Ezekiel discovers why. It's because of Israel's idolatry and injustice that has compelled God to abandon his own temple. And while there is still hope for the future, the book went on to develop Ezekiel's message of divine judgment, first for Israel and then for the nations around Israel. And then a key moment happened in chapter 33. Ezekiel receives a report that the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem is over because the city has fallen. The temple is destroyed. Ezekiel's grim words of warning came true. The exile was the most horrendous catastrophe that ever happened to Israel. And it raised the big questions of whether God was done with Israel for good. But remember, at the end of chapter 11, God promised that there was still a future beyond exile for Israel. And so the rest of the book is designed to explore Ezekiel's vision of hope. First for Israel, then for the nations, and then for all of creation. The hope for Israel begins with God promising to raise up a new David, a future messianic king who's going to be the kind of leader that Israel needed but never got. And this new Israel who's going to come under the messianic king's rule is going to be a transformed people. God's going to deal with the heart of their problem of rebellion by giving them new hearts. It's just like Moses promised at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. God says he's going to remove their hard hearts and send his spirit into his people to give them new soft hearts that can love and obey their God. And this idea gets developed in the next strange vision. Ezekiel sees a huge valley filled up with dry human bones and skeletons. And God tells him that it's an image, a metaphor for Israel's spiritual state. So their rebellion against God, it resulted in exile and the literal death of many people, but it was also a metaphorical death of their covenant relationship. And God tells Ezekiel that his spirit is coming to bring his people back to life. And so this wind comes and it causes all of the bones to stand up and it fills them with breath and life and then skin grows over the bones and then all of a sudden Ezekiel sees all of these new humans standing in front of him. 
Now this vision, it's recalling the story about the creation of humans in Genesis chapter 2, where God made humans out of dirt and divine breath. And so Israel and all humanity have rebelled, resulting in death. And so the only hope is that God would perform a new act of creation and remake humans in such a way that they can truly live in a relationship of love with God and with each other. And so after God is going to deal with the evil that's in the hearts of his own people, some questions still remain unresolved. Like, what about the evil that's still rampant out there among the nations? And what about the future of God's dwelling place in the temple? And this is what the final two sections of the book are about. So first come chapters 38 and 39, and they promise God's final defeat of evil among the nations, which gets personified by a ruler who's named Gog from the land of Magog. Now this name is derived from a genealogy of ancient kingdoms and lands from Genesis chapter 10, and it referred to powerful nations from the distant past. And so Ezekiel picks up this ancient biblical name as an image of any and all violent kingdoms. And so we find that Gog gets allied with seven nations that come from all four directions of the compass is clearly an image that represents all of the nations. And this also helps us understand why Ezekiel describes Gog with images that he used earlier in the book to describe the king of Tyre and the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. For Ezekiel, Gog is an amalgam of all of the worst, most violent people in the Bible. Gog is the archetype of human rebellion against God. The basic story in these chapters is that Gog resists God's plan to restore his people. And so just like Pharaoh in the Exodus story, Gog comes to destroy the people. But God unleashes his justice on Gog, and it's in a flurry of scenes that don't actually make very good literal sense if you read them in sequence. Because first, Gog and his armies are consumed by an earthquake, but then they're consumed by fire two different times. And then after that, God comes and strikes Gog and his army down in the fields where they lay unburied for months. It's clear that these scenes are full of symbol and imagery. Ezekiel has pulled out his entire poetic tool set here to describe how God is determined to finally defeat human evil that has ruined his world. And it's so that he can pave the way for a new creation. And so once evil is finally dealt with among the nations, the last section of the book describes how God's presence is going to one day return to his people and his temple to bring cosmic restoration. So Ezekiel first gets this long elaborate vision of a new temple and a new city. He's given this heavenly tour guide who shows him around the new temple complex and it's much larger and more majestic than even Solomon's temple. There's a new altar, new priests, a whole new system of worship. And then after this elaborate tour, God's glorious throne chariot that he saw back in his first vision comes back and it enters the new temple. Now the meaning of these temple visions has been the source of debate for a long, long time. So some Christian and Jewish readers believe that this vision will be fulfilled literally one day and that these chapters offer the actual blueprints of the new temple that will be built when the Messiah returns and brings God's kingdom. But many other Jewish and Christian readers think that this vision, like all of Ezekiel's other visions, is full of symbols. And they depict the reality of God's presence returning to his people in the messianic kingdom, but not necessarily in the form of an actual building. Whichever view you take, it's important that Ezekiel never calls the city Jerusalem. And chapters 47 and 48 show why. Ezekiel sees this tiny stream pouring out of the temple threshold and steps, and then it quickly becomes this raging river, and then it flows out of the temple and the city into the desert, into one of the most desolate places on planet Earth, the Dead Sea Valley. And then that river, it leaves behind it a trail of trees and life, and then the Dead Sea gets transformed into a living sea that's teeming with plants and animals. All of this imagery comes from the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And we see just how cosmic Ezekiel's vision really is. God's plan has always been to restore all humanity and all creation back to his life-giving presence. And so the book ends with the name of this garden city. The Lord is there. And so Ezekiel's visions come to a close, full of hope for a new future, new humans living in a new world that's animated by God's life-giving spirit. It's a world permeated with God's love and justice. And that's what the book of Ezekiel is all about. Okay, that's a pretty good graphic uh, capturing. If you've never seen that before to see what Ezekiel is about, they've, they've done an excellent job with that. Um, 
do a small little survey of it, and then we'll get into some of the things we typically get into every week. As I said, he prophesies among the Jewish exiles in Babylon uh, in this, the last days. The siege lasted about 20 years. You know, we don't we don't think in those terms these days, but I mean they they and we'll see in a little bit that it was actually carried out in three phases of, a, of the Babylonian siege of Judah, and particularly of Jerusalem. His message is, has more hope than Jeremiah's did, even though we put, pointed out in Jeremiah there was this this warning of judgment, this this promise of a future. It's it's a it's a cycle that when you read. Uh, the Old Testament, uh, you see it over and over and over again. It's how God dealt with his people. The, uh, the book breaks down into four sections uh, by the material that I, that I use. It won't track exactly like the video, but there's this chapters 1 to 3 are the commission of Ezekiel. God calls Ezekiel uh, to himself. Uh, the, chapters 4 to 24 is is uh, the prophesy, prophesying of the judgment of God upon Judah and why. And they went over that in the video. Then the judgment on the Gentiles. So, so the, the people of God are judged. The nations around them are judged. And then the promise in chapter 33 to 48 of, of a restoration coming, a day coming. When you look at the, uh, at the commission of Ezekiel in 1 to 3, when you read those chapters, you should be reminded of how God dealt with Moses in chapter 31 of, no, pardon me, in chapter 3 of, of Exodus, verses 1 to 10, where he commissions Moses to go. Uh, Isaiah, we just saw, recently saw Isaiah, uh, the, the call of Isaiah, chapter 6. Many people are familiar with that. And then we're going to see next week in Daniel, in chapter 10, verses 5 to 14. And of course, prominent in our minds would be how God uh, deals with the Apostle John in the Revelation. I'm going to, you're going to write, and I'm going to tell you what has been, what is, and what will be. And he commissions him in chapter 1, verses 12 to 19. God gives to Ezekiel a definite instruction. The, the, the whole temple description with all of its details is kind of, kind of fascinating. And you will look in a little bit to wonder, you know, why the details if it's not physical. Uh, God also enabled Ezekiel and then put a huge weight of responsibility on him. In, in Chapters 4 to 24, you have judgment, the judgment of Judah pronounced. Uh, these are God's chosen people, and they've sinned against him. Uh, he does this through signs. Uh, you may have found it kind of strange, the description that you, you were given in the video, but Ezekiel comes off uh, like a real kook, uh, unless what he's doing has been commissioned by God. The things when he binds himself and lies down and eats... Uh, food prepared in the most strange way. Uh, he preaches sermons, and, the, and the, the warning is, judgment is certain. You will, you will not escape the judgment of God. It's gone too far. Been plenty of warnings through the other prophets, warnings to repent, warnings, but it's gone too far. In chapters 8 to 11, uh, Judah's catalog of sins in the past are brought out in a series of visions surrounding primarily the abominations surrounding the temple. Uh, they're, they're treating uh, people unjustly. Uh, and then this departing of the glory of God. There's a term uh, in Hebrew, it's called Ichabod. You ever heard that, that name? Okay, Ichabod is what you pronounce in Hebrew. And it means uh, Ich is departed. Kavod, the glory has departed, uh, is the meaning of that. And so this, this idea of God withdrawing his countenance, his, his smiling countenance, withdrawing his presence. Think about this. It was inconceivable to these people. And you kind of wonder why, because God was with them for 40 years in the wilderness, and they told that story over and over. But it was inconceivable to these people that once the temple was built that God would meet them anywhere else. And so when they were carried away from the temple, <clears throat> in their minds, they were carried away from God. And the fact that God would let them be taken out of their own land and not be able to gather uh, in the temple and in their surrounding synagogues to worship in their minds meant then God's through with us. And so uh, the glory of God leaves the temple, uh, moves to the Mount of Olives, and then of course 
Ezekiel has the vision of it appearing in Babylon. Chapters 12 to 24 in this section uh, speak of the, the causes and extent of Judah's coming judgment. And again, signs, uh, sermons, parables, stories to make a point. Uh, Ezekiel points out, led by God, that Judah's uh, prophets are counterfeits. Her elders are idolatrous. They're a fruitless vine. Uh, they're an adulterous wife. Uh, the warning is that Babylon will swoop down like an eagle and pluck them up, and they will not be aided by Egypt. They're in alliance with Egypt and Tyre, and uh, they will not come to their rescue. The people find themselves accountable to God and responsible for their own sins. And Ezekiel presses upon them that this judgment that has come is not unjust. It does not betray some, a flaw in the character of God. It exposes your continual rebellion, yours and that of your, of your ancestors. <clears throat> and so you have this God answering the unfaithfulness of his people with judgment, but there, there's this rippling effect that's going to start with the promise of God of restoration. Then there's this, this warning against the Gentiles. God does this often. We pointed this out before. That he will, he will raise up a Nebuchadnezzar to punish his people for their, for their unfaithfulness, their rebellion. And then turn around and punish Nebuchadnezzar because he uh, inflicted harm upon the people of God. God actually calls Nebuchadnezzar at one point, my king. I'll raise up my king, Nebuchadnezzar. So this is, shows the sovereignty of God in these things. Um, As you could anticipate, people that see, that have been told, the surrounding nations, that God is with Israel, that Jehovah is the covenant God of Israel, when these terrible things befall them, then they are taunted by the surrounding uh, nations. And uh, one writer pointed out, and I had not seen that, he said, when you look on a map, that, that Ezekiel addresses these clockwise as Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, and Sidon. Remember when Jesus talks about that in the, in the New Testament, about it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you, Bethsaida, Capernaum. Because they didn't see what you've seen. He focuses in on Tyre, and this is an interesting thing. I want, I want to point out a passage here because commentators are, are uh, they differ here, but there's, there's, a, there's many of them who suggest that the description of the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28, 11 to 19, it's, it's eerily similar to somebody. I'm going to read it, and then we'll, we'll see if you pick it up. In Ezekiel 28, 11 to 19, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, Every precious stone was your covering, sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle. And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian, cherub. What's that sounding like to you? A guardian cherub. Now, it's, Lucifer is the picture that comes into play here. Well, get, listen to the continued description. I placed you. You were, you were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. You were blameless in your own ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you. O guardian cherub. If the word cherub wasn't in there, I would say, well, he could, this may be a flourishing description of Adam, as God, God created Adam in the garden. But that cherub, that picture of an angel, is, is uh, intriguing. O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes upon you. By the multitude of your iniquities, in the unrighteousness of your trade, 
You profaned your sanctuary, so I brought fire out from your midst. It consumed you, and I turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You've come to a dreadful end. It shall be no more forever. If it's not Satan, and I think it's up for debate, then clearly the king of, of, of Tyre is, is an embodiment of that which is satanic. That's how, how wicked he is. And so then you have, in addition to this, some oracles against Egypt. Egypt is different from Tyre and Sidon. They, they do not uh, fall under the siege of Babylon, but they are, they are rendered. Egypt, which was up till this time the most powerful nation in the world, is rendered impotent because they cannot come against the Babylonian Empire. The description of it is it exists as the lowliest of the kingdoms. And one writer made the observation, he said, he said, since that time it has never recovered its former glory or influence. And so then you have the last movement in Ezekiel, this restoration of Israel. They're given in the, in the aftermath of hearing of the overthrow that, that Jerusalem has finally, ultimately been sacked. Because the, the, the captives until that time were, they were thinking that the, that the captivity would not be that long and that they would, they would be returning to Jerusalem and, and find it perhaps uh, with, with, with smoke and, and the effects of war, but not, not destroyed. So Ezekiel's prophecies move beyond when he announces the utter destruction when this herald comes in, in chapter 33 to tell him about it. But now they turn on the positive theme of comfort and consolation. Ezekiel promises that as surely as the judgment has come, blessing will also come. God's people will be regathered and restored. It's interesting here, just they had hope in getting out and returning home until the situation was hopeless. And when it's hopeless, then that's when they are brought face to face that the only way they will get home is the move of God. That God rises up on their behalf. Ezekiel is God's watchman in this situation. The false shepherds, their rulers, will be replaced and overshadowed by the true shepherd who will lead them in the future. We'll see that as one of the messianic pictures. This vision of the valley of dry bones pictures the reanimation of the nation by the Spirit of God. Israel and Judah will be purified and reunited. There will be an invasion by the northern armies of God, but Israel will be saved because the Lord will destroy the invading forces. This picture of the dry bones, if you haven't read that in a while, there's so many, so many things that are so instructive there. When, when God takes Ezekiel in one of his visions to the to the edge, to the precipice, and he looks down upon it, he says there was this valley of dry bones. It's as if it was a place where a battle had taken place, and, there, and they didn't even bury the dead. They're just left uh, as carrion uh, for, the, for the birds of prey. And so now they're just, and he says they're dry, very, very dry. This, this idea, these, are, these, are, these folks are dead. There's no restoring this. And, and in the vision, God asks Ezekiel a question, son of man, can these bones live? I love Ezekiel's answer. It needs to be our answer when we think about the hope we have in God, the hope for any situation, whether it's your, your life, your family, uh, your community, your, your nation, our world. Son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel gives the only answer appropriate. Lord, you know. The idea of being Lord, only you know that, yeah. I can't see beyond it. And I don't have the power to bring them. But Lord, you know. Assigning glory and honor and sovereignty to God. And then my friend, I've told you, my friend R.F. Gates preached one of the best sermons I've ever heard in my life. And I've been treated to some really great sermons over my life. On this passage, when Ezekiel's answer, Lord, you know, God said, Prophesy to the bones, son of man. And my friend R.F. said, 
we learn from that today that, that we're, when we speak, whether we're preaching or teaching or just in, in, in gospel dialogue, we are talking to people that are not yet followers of Christ who are dead in trespasses and sins. They're, they're like a valley of dry bones. We can't do anything to get them to come to life on our own. But we're to speak the truth to them. It, it seems like a, it's, it's an odd uh, disconnection there. Well, if they can't do anything, why... Why, if they can't repent, why command them to repent? If they, if they can't believe, why command them to believe? That's God's way. That's what he says to Ezekiel. Prophesy out of the bones. The bones are dead. They're very, very dead. Prophesy out of the bones. And then he says, Ezekiel, call for the wind. Call for the wind. And, and my friend R.F. Gates pointed he said, that's, that's where we live as, as followers of Jesus Christ committed to sharing the gospel. He says, we must do all we can do or we must do all that can be done to see sinners boys and girls men and women come to faith in christ he said but we've got to recognize that we cannot finally do what must be done we do all we can do but we cannot do what must happen in bones and so he likens the the prophesying and the calling for the wind to to preaching or teaching or sharing verbalizing the gospel and then praying Pray for the Spirit to come and bring life to the bones. And that's exactly what happens, of course, in this picture. And an army is raised up, and that's the image in that context, is this is what you're looking at, son of man, is what I'm going to do to my people. I'm going to raise them up, bring them back to life. Okay? And then he's, he's, uh, he's given these very intricate details of the temple. I think they said on the video he's given a virtual tour of a, of a temple. The idea of the glory of the Lord returning. Now, we'll touch on this at the end, but you sincere people, good people, come down very differently on the significance of this. There's a group uh, on, 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 let's say, the extreme side of those who believe that this is physical that there's going to be a temple rebuilt. In fact, they will tell you if it's going to be built where it was, it's, going to, it's got a challenge. It's got to be built right on top of the Muslim uh, mosque, the Dome of the Rock. It is sitting right where the temple sat. Now, there's this group that I would call is on the extreme side of this. They are, uh, there's archaeologists who sift through Archaeological remains looking for what they call the, and I don't know how you find this by the way, the ashes of the red heifer. If you know anything about the sacrificial system, that in order for you to go from one sacrificial period to the next, you had to carry the ashes of, the, of this heifer that was slaughtered. And you carry the ashes and that's what you use to begin to rekindle or to kindle the flame for the next sacrificial arrangement. But you can't just on your own say, well, let's, Let's have a religious barbecue. I'll get no, no. You got to have the ashes from the previous one to keep a continuity, a successionism. And so there are people that devote their lives, smart people, brilliant people, archaeologists, to trying to locate the ashes of the red heifer. It's their, it's their belief that once they have found those, that that will trigger setting in motion uh, a new eon. Now, I, I really believe that you you're hard pressed with a, with a good consistent approach to interpreting Ezekiel, which is both prophetic and apocalyptic, apocalyptic meaning unveiling like revelation, you're hard pressed to, to lock in on, on literal things because so much in it is so figurative. And I think you're, it's, for me at least, a better part of it. Don't, I don't cast aspersion on folks that, that differ with that, but I think that that's a, that's a wiser path. Now. have a note here it's all this this last part happens in 572 which is 14 years after 586 after the after the fall of Jerusalem there's regulations concerning worship that come in this detailed description uh, revelations about the new land the new city okay let's shift gears a little bit um, what about the uh, the title the title of the book we call it Ezekiel. Uh, we know that from the background of it, he was uh, he was uh, scheduled to be ordained, if you, if I can use that word, as a priest. 
at the age of 30, but he finds himself five years hence in Babylon in the captivity. God commissions him as a prophet. He's a prophet and a priest. Interesting combination. He's carried off to Babylon before the final assault on Jerusalem. The Hebrew name is Yehezkiel, all right? It means God strengthens or strengthened by God. It's a significant name. He was named this uh, before he's carried off. He's named this as a child. And, and the one thing that the people needed to have hope in is that while they felt weak and helpless and hopeless, that they would be strengthened by God. That's his name is given. And God does strengthen him for this prophetic ministry. Look at, look at Ezekiel 3, 8, and 9. This is just a little snapshot of his calling, of his commissioning. It's interesting what God says to him there. He says, Behold, I've made your face as hard as their faces, and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. These are hard-headed people, all right? <laughs> and nobody's going to listen to him. Remember, Jeremiah just cried all the time, right? He just wept and wept and wept. And God says to Ezekiel, I've, I've made you hard-headed. And I've given you a face that's going to be determined. Like emery, harder than flint have I made your forehead. Fear them not, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. And when you see the, the way that Ezekiel carries out his prophecies uh, under God, I mean, he... He doesn't fear the face of man. He does some of the most crazy things and, and would leave him open to the charge of being a lunatic, and yet he does them unabated. The name itself uh, occurs twice in this prophecy, uh, and we'll look at that in a minute. The Greek form of the name, we've done this throughout all of it, where we have to look at the Hebrew term, then the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, uh, the Greek name is Iezkel, Iezkel. And you, you kind of almost hear that Ie, as you hear in, in, in the name Jesus, Iezkel. And the Latin form in the, in the Vulgate is Ezekiel. And that's where we get it. We get our Ezekiel from that. Okay? He's the son of Buzi, we're told in chapter 1, verse 3. He had a wife uh, who died as a sign to Judah when Nebuchadnezzar began his final siege on Jerusalem. I want you to see what God said to him. I want you to hear, carry the burden of the prophet for a moment. Ezekiel 24, 16 to 24. Son of man, behold, I'm about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. Tell his wife. Yet you shall not mourn or weep, nor shall your tears run down. It's a good thing God gave him that hard head. Sigh, but not aloud. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban and put your shoes on your feet. Do not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and in the evening my wife died. And on the next morning I did as I was commanded. The people said to me, will you not tell us what these things mean for us, that you're acting this way? Do you remember in the life of David? When he mourned in sackcloth and ashes, when the, when the child born from him to Bathsheba was born ill, and he was on his face pleading with God to spare the life of the child, spare the life of the child, and the child died. When the child died, David got up, cleaned himself up. This is, this is going completely opposite direction of this particular culture they lived in. That should have been when his mourning set in. He cleans himself up, he asks for food, and they said, we don't understand. <laughs> when the child was in the throes of death, you were mourning and grieving and crying out, and now he's died. And David says, it's a, it's a fascinating thing, he says, I wanted the child, I asked the Lord to spare the child, he is not. I will, he will not come back to me, but I will go to him. Uh, there's a note of of David's hopeful resignation in God's goodness, even in the face of trial. So they ask Ezekiel here, 
What does this mean? Why are you acting this way? He said to them, The word of the Lord came to me. Say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power. See, what should the sanctuary have been? Jesus tells us a house of prayer for all the nations, right? A place to gather before God. I'll profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the delight of your eyes, and the yearning of your soul, and your sons and your daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword. And you shall do as I have done. This is Ezekiel speaking to them now. You shall not cover your lips nor eat the bread of men. Your turbans shall be on your heads, your shoes on your feet. You shall not mourn or weep, but you shall rot away in your iniquities and groan to one another. Thus shall Ezekiel be to you a sign. The Lord says in early verses, I've set, I've set you as a sign. According to all that he has done, you shall do. When this comes, then you will know that I am the Lord your God. It's a strange thing. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around. It's not how we think, how we function, but that is God teaching his people. This has fallen upon you because of you, but, you, but do not grow hopeless, wallowing in the throes of grief because there's a better day coming. That's the implication. It hadn't been said yet, but that's coming. So, his ministry, with his priestly background, it shouldn't surprise us that there's a lot of emphasis on the, the priesthood, the temple, sacrifices, and the, and the Shekinah, the glory of God. God gives him a lot of visions about God's power and about God's plan. So Ezekiel is the author, and I'll just give you a couple of places I mentioned earlier. Let's, let's see where, it cut, where the name comes up. Look at Ezekiel 1.3. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by Chevar Canal. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. And then chapter 24, verse 24, thus shall Ezekiel be to you a sign. So you, you see the name itself coming up within uh, that. And there are people... And I am not skilled in this. I've got to rely upon the folks who are. There are people who give their whole lives to textual criticism. That doesn't mean speaking poorly of the biblical text. It means to examine it at a deep level. And the grammar, all the way through it, you, you'll pick up things like uh, son of man. Is used, there's a consistency in the use of that term. The word of the Lord came to me. Uh, the glory of the Lord. These terms crop up, and the grammar is very consistent to lead one to conclude that one person is responsible for this document, not several authors. Well, when was it written? Well, we, to get that, we need to see how Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Judah, in particular Jerusalem. Three stages. The first was in 605 B.C. That's when he launched his attack. At that point, you remember our history we studied, he overcame Jehoiakim and carried off key hostages, including Daniel and his friends. Battle still raging. In 597 BC, the rebellion of Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim brought further punishment. And Nebuchadnezzar made Jerusalem submit a second time. He carried off 10,000 hostages, including Jehoiakim and Ezekiel. That's the, so Daniel went in the first wave. Eight years later, Ezekiel. And the third, the third stage in 586, which we're all familiar with, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city after a long siege and disrupted all of Judah. It is referenced as the 30th year in chapter 1, verse 1, and, and it seems to appeal to the 30th year, not the 30th year of the siege, but the 30th year of Ezekiel. It refers to Ezekiel's age. He was 25 years old when he was taken to Babylon and 30 years old when he received the commission from God. This means, when you put the chronology together, I found this fascinating, he was about 17 when Daniel was deported in 605 B.C. So that Ezekiel and Daniel were about the same age. Both men were about 20 years younger than Jeremiah, who was ministering in Jerusalem. If you lay this chronology out, Ezekiel was born in 622 B.C., deported to Babylon, in 597 B.C., prophesied from 592 B.C. to about 570 B.C., and died about 560 B.C. So 
if you lay that on a timeline, he overlaps Jeremiah's ministry, uh, the end of Jeremiah's ministry, and the beginning of Daniel's ministry. And we'll see more of that uh, next week. By the time Ezekiel arrives in Babylon, Daniel has already established, he's well known among the captives. Uh, he's been given a Babylonish name, Belshazzar. And he's mentioned three times in Ezekiel's prophecy. Just look at these passages real quickly. Just in Ezekiel 14, 14, uh, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver. And so you, this, the, the coming up of Daniel's name. Ezekiel 14, 20, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, declares the Lord, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. And then finally, Ezekiel 28, 3, you are indeed wiser than Daniel. No secret is hidden from you. When Ezekiel was taken off to captivity, he took up his residence in Tel Aviv. Uh, it was the principal city, principal colony of the, of the Jewish exiles along the river Chebar. Uh, Chebar was known as, as Nebuchadnezzar's Grand Canal. From 592 to 586, Ezekiel found himself uh, trying to convince the, the unbelieving Jews Jewish exiles that there was no hope of immediate return. I mentioned this earlier. And it wasn't until they heard that Jerusalem had been destroyed. Remember when Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, there was no stone, no two stones on top of another. They sacked the place and leveled it completely. In some of these sieges when foreign, when foreign powers would do that, they would go out into the fields and sow the fields in salt. If you know anything about that, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about farming, but I do know from my farming friends, you sow the seeds, fields in salt they won't produce for a while. You've got to get that, get that out of the soil. So when they, when they heard that Jerusalem had been destroyed, their, their hopes, their feign, feigning hopes of return were just decimated. They were abandoned. It is believed that Ezekiel wrote this prophecy down shortly after the incidents recorded and it occurred. So uh, his active ministry lasted for about 22 years. And we, I'll just give you the references of those. Ezekiel 1-2 on the, on the fifth day of the month. It was the fifth year of the exile of Jehoiakim. So that kind of gives you a timeline there. And then in chapter 29-17, in the 27th year, in the first month, on the first day of the month. So there's some real specific dating here. And when, when you can put all this together, you realize it's about a 22-year ministry of prophecy. And the book was probably completed around 565 B.C. What is the theme and purpose of it? Well, like some of the other books we've looked at, you find this, this dual theme of condemnation, chapters 1 to 33, and con uh, 32, and consolation, chapters 33 to 48. Just, the Lord has acted justly with them, to judge them, he will be merciful to restore their land and restore them to their land. When the city failed, Ezekiel spent the time comforting the people, assuring them that God's covenant promise of future blessing would come to pass. Ezekiel in these messages puts a heavy emphasis on the sovereignty, the glory, and the faithfulness of God. I want to just real, look real quickly at some of these, these themes. There's this, this picture of what it would call God's heavenly glory, the, the Shekinah. Look with me real quickly just at a few, a few verses to see this. In Ezekiel 1.28, like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain. That sounds uh, very uh, much like the covenant promise made to, to Noah. So was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking. So there's this being gripped with the, with the heavenly presence. Ezekiel 3.12. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me the voice of a great earthquake. Blessed be the gl glory of the Lord from its place. Um, this earthquake, this, this sound of, of, of a multitude. Then Ezekiel 3.23. So I rose and went out into the valley, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there, like the glory that I had seen by the Chebar Canal. 
and I fell on my face. And so this is Isaiah. Same thing in Isaiah 6. There's also this, uh, this theme that runs through sort of a sub-theme of God's departing glory. Look at these passages with me. Ezekiel 9.3. Now the glory of, God, of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing cast at his waist. A, a picture of the, of, of the ancient of days. Then chapter 10 verse 4. And the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub to the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud. We went to Shekinah, with the, the bright, imminent presence of God. And the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. And then again, Ezekiel 10, 18 to 19. Then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth before my eyes as they went out with the wheels beside them. This is that vessel that you saw drawn in the video. And they stood at the entrance of the east gate of the house of the Lord, and the glory of the Lord of Israel was over them. So this picture of the glory moving, the glory departing. And then 11, 22, and 23. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. So now it's left the temple. It's left the city. That's the vision that he's getting. And then one more thing, the God's earthly glory. So I'm pointing this out so you can see that, that one of the sub-themes in Ezekiel, he is consumed with the glory of the Lord. And where it is, okay? So the, the earthly glory, his purpose to bless his people even through judgment. Ezekiel 43, 1 to 5. Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing east, and behold, the glory of, God, of the God of Israel was coming from the east, and the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. Isaiah standing in the temple, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The, the angelic beings cried out, the earth is full of his glory. And we go on here. And the vision I saw was just like the vision that I had seen when he came to destroy the city and just like the vision that I had seen by the Cherbar Canal. And I fell on my face as the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east. The spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Get the picture if you followed this. This, this departing glory. First of all, this, the ascending glory. And then the departing glory. And now the returning glory fills the temple. Well, one of the, uh, then one, uh, one more. Ezekiel 44, 4. Then he brought me by the way of the north gate to the front of the temple. And I looked and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple of the Lord. And I fell on my face. So you, this, is a, this is a recurring theme. This is, Ezekiel and these incredible visions God is giving him. And it's the same response when he comes in, in contact with the glory of God. He falls on his face. Well, what about the keys? The keys to the book. Well, the key word or phrase is the restoration of Israel. The key verses we have already read, and I, and I went through those, but I want to point this out to you. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36. This is, this is a companion passage of hope like we find in Jeremiah 31 on the New Covenant. Now let's put our covenant lenses, our covenant ears on. In the video they talked about how the people had broken the covenant. They're talking about the, the, the Sinai covenant. They're talking about them breaking the Ten Commandments, ignoring things like, you shall have no other gods before me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The, the commandments to do justice to one another. They trampled those underfoot. They had broken that. But I want to remind you that before that, we studied this years ago, God makes a covenant. The word covenant, by the way, in the Hebrew, you cut a covenant. It's, a, it's, a, it's an agreement signed by cutting. If, you watch, if you're an old Western fan like I was growing up, and, and, a, and a cowboy and an Indian made friends, what did they do? They would cut one another's hands, put them together, and they became what? Blood brothers, right? That's the picture. That's the picture. <clears throat> well, that was the mentality. You cut a covenant. And, and in, in, the, in the days of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and going forward, they would take animals and cut them in two. If it was significant enough. If the, and if you and I had an agreement about something, we would take some kind of an animal, maybe a bullock, maybe a ram, cut it in two. We would pledge to one another these terms. We would both pass between them. 
and what, in passing between them say, if I don't hold up my bargain on this, may what happened to this animal happen to me. May I be cut asunder. All right? Keep that picture in mind. We looked at this some time ago. I just want to remind you of it. When God ratified the covenant with Abram, he caused a deep... He, first of all, he said, Abram, take these animals and cut them in half. And so he had a, a, a sequence of several animals. Cut them in half, spread them out. He caused a deep sleep to fall over Abram. Then God, we're told, moves through these pieces uh, like a smoking pot. The flame and the, and the smoke rendering up of, of aroma and incense. Abram doesn't go between those pieces. It's a unilateral. If, if you and I make a covenant and pass between the pieces, it's a bilateral. Abraham slept. And God says, may it be done to me if I do not fulfill all the words I've promised you. Okay? Now think about that. Listen to this. This is, the, this is the language of the new covenant here. Jeremiah has the same kind of thing. Look at verse 24, chapter 36. I will take from you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. If they do what? There's no if they do there. I will do this. His name is tied to his people being recovered and restored so that Messiah can come out of his people ethnically separate from the rest of the world. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. The cleansing from the idols doesn't mean I will wash you up so you can continue. No, my, the cleansing from the idols is we will remove idolatry from your heart. It's, in Jeremiah, the language is, I will take away the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. Verse 26, And I will give you a new heart, a new spirit will I put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. You see that language there? Now, this is the language of the new covenant. This is a promise of God. This was designed to remind them God is faithful to his covenant promises. And he will act to honor his name whether his people do or not. So you drop down now in this language of the new covenant. Listen, verse 33. Thus says the Lord God, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited. In other words, I will, I will move in such a way that, that the desolate places are going to be filled with with the population of my people. The waste place is rebuilt. The land that was desolate shall be tilled instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And it makes you wonder, did, did they salt the land? Did, did the Babylonians salt it? And God says, that's not too tough for me. It's going to grow. And they will say, this land was desolate and has become like the Garden of Eden. That's a powerful imagery. Because all the I wills God is going to do in the new covenant for those for whom Jesus died, we're going to be taken to a place better than Eden. Eden restored, except in our, in our Eden, in our paradise, in our new heaven and new earth, there are not sinful choices. We will sin no more. They will say this land is like the Garden of Eden. The waste and desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. So that's a, those are your key, the key language. The language of hope, God's purpose and determination to fulfill his covenant faithfulness to a, to a people who had not been faithful. And then chapter 37, in the Valley of Dry Bones, uh, there's a whole book, you ought to get a hold of it. If you, if you like, I don't know if you're, some people don't do this, but if you like reading prayers, there's a book called The Valley of Vision, published by Banner Truth. It may even be available digitally now. But it's a collection of Puritan prayers. And, and they take the Valley of Vision from Ezekiel looking over that very tragic scene and yet crying out to God and seeing things come to life. It seemed impossible. Uh, so that's, that's the imagery here. It spells out Israel's future very clearly. What about Jesus? Jesus. 
in Ezekiel? Where do we see, where do we see Jesus in Ezekiel? He said in John's gospel, you search the scriptures, you think that in them you find life, and they speak of me. As if to say to the Pharisees and to any of us, anyone who reads the scriptures and doesn't come face to face with me is, is not reading the scriptures profitably, not reading the scriptures for what they were designed. That's why when we come to read the scriptures, we ought to pray, Dear God, open my eyes that I may see the wonders of my Savior. Well, look at Ezekiel 17, 22 to 24. It depicts the Messiah as a tender twig that becomes a stately cedar on a lofty mountain. In other words, an inauspicious beginning that grows into a majestic cedar. Look at these verse, verses with me. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one. And I myself, you see that? I, I will, I will, see that language there? I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. And on the mountain height of Israel will I plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it will dwell every kind of bird. In the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. It reminds you of the language where God told Abram, look up and count the stars if you can. That's how your offspring is going to be. Look at the sands of the sea. Can you count them? That's your offspring because of my promise. So this promise that the, that the birds will take refuge in the shade of the Messiah. And all the trees of the field, verse 24, shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree. Dry up the green tree. Remember when Jesus encountered the fig tree? Cursed it. And make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. This reminds you, of course, again, in Isaiah's prophecy, uh, Jesus is called the branch in chapter 11, verse 1. In Jeremiah, similar language. Zechariah, similar language. We'll see that when we get to Zechariah. He's also, the Messiah is the king who has the right to rule in Ezekiel. Look at Ezekiel 21, 26 and 27. Thus says the Lord God, remove the turban, take off the crown. Things shall not remain as they are. Remember earlier when he was telling Ezekiel how to handle his grief? Keep your turban on. Things shall not remain as they are. Exalt that which is low and bring low that which is exalted. A ruin, ruin, ruin I will make. This also shall not be until he comes, the one to whom judgment belongs, and I will give it to him. The Messiah is coming, and he alone has the authority to judge, not not the leaders of Israel who missed it by a mile. Not the Babylonians who took the people of God captive and did despicable things to them. Only Messiah. And then the final, this is a longer passage, but he's the true shepherd who will deliver and feed his flock. Listen to this indictment of the leaders of the day and this, this promise of the rising of the true shepherd. 34, chapter 34, verse 11 to 31. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. And as, shepherds, as a shepherd seeks out his flock when he's among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rest. What's the picture of scattering there, you think? It's captivity, isn't it? You've been scattered. I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I'll bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into the, their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. How many times is he going to say the mountains of Israel? In other words, you're going back to Israel. I'm going to bring you back. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make them lie down. Psalm 23, he makes me lie down in green pasture, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the stray, and I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice, 
As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture, that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture, and to drink of clear water, that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet? No, he's, he's chiding them now because of how they treated his blessings. They spurned and abused and took for granted his blessings. And must, verse 19, must my sheep eat while you've trodden with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet? Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between fat sheep and lean sheep. Now he's talking about the leaders and the people. Because you push with side and shoulder and thrust it all the week with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. Who do you think that is? That's the Messiah. Yeah. And he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will make with them a covenant of peace. It's a different kind of language for the new covenant. And banish wild beasts from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will send down the showers in their season. And there shall be showers of blessing. Sound like a hymn that we sing? That's exactly where it comes from. And the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield its increase, and they shall be secure in their land. And they shall know that I am the Lord. That's the emphasis here. I'm going to move in such a way that you don't, you don't need these fading hopes of being able to return from captivity. I will move in such a way that you know that I have done this. I have brought you back. They will know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yoke. And deliver them from the land of those who enslave them. They shall no more be a prey to the nations, nor shall the beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell securely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will provide for them renowned plantations, so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land, and no longer suffer the reproach of the nations. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. And you are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the Lord God. That's power. I mean, you see that imagery where Jesus presents himself in the New Testament, that he's the good shepherd. He's the gate to the sheepfold. Nobody comes in, gets in by him. You come through him. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. My sheep hear my voice, John 10 says, and I know them and they, they follow me. What about his contribution to the Bible, this, this book? It brings a lot of exactness. Someone said this, I thought he said, Ezekiel has a methodical style. Careful dating, really more dating than we've seen in some of these other prophecies. The imagery is just, no other prophet comes off like Ezekiel does. The way he teaches, he teaches in, in what is one they said street acting. He teaches in parables. He teaches in uh, with with the visions. He shares the visions. He he has sermons. God told him in chapter twelve, verse six, and I'm going to close with this. In their sight, you shall lift the baggage upon your shoulder and carry it out at dusk. You shall cover your face that you may not see the lamb, for I have made you a sign for the house of Israel. <clears throat> in case you're interested, in, in the course of this prophecy, there are nine signs found in chapters 4 to 24, and a tenth sign is in chapter 37. There are six visions recorded, six parables taught, what you would call apocalyptic passages. The, the, this, the word apocalypse it's from the Latin apocalypsis, which means unveiling. It's, it's been hidden and now it's brought to light. The book of Revelation is apocalyptic. Much of Daniel is apocalyptic. But there's, there's a, several of these passages. Some of the passages are hard to interpret in Ezekiel. There's no, there's no getting around that. People have differences in terms of what some of these things mean. Are they, are they literal? Are they spiritual? But this is what we know. 
that Ezekiel highlights God's sovereignty, his justice, his mercy, the promise of hope, that God is true to his covenant and faithfulness. And that's, I think that's what we take away from this. Whatever we're going through, sometimes it may feel like God's abandoned you. But if you belong to him, if you've been saved by grace through faith, if you're one of his sheep, as he describes it, he doesn't abandon you. He doesn't abandon you. The Lord's my shepherd. I shall have lack of nothing that I need. Because he's, he's involved with me. He makes me lie down. Sometimes, sometimes I wonder. I've known people that run and run and run and run and run and they just kind of collapse physically. I just wonder, is he making you to lie down? Is that it? He's just rest. He leads me beside still waters. You know that, that if sheep get around running water and they look in it to drink, they, they get, they get kind of dizzy and they will fall in. And if a sheep falls in water and he's got all of his, all of his wool, he's done for. Still waters. Even if it's that still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. The picture there's the wagon tracks of righteousness. The roads in the, in the ancient world would travel. You, there, were, there were few and far between. So when you had a road, you traveled it. And the wagon tracks would, would put ruts in the road. And if you were traveling that road with your wagon and you got in the ruts... Uh, it, was the, it was the closest thing to, you hear about a lot about these self-propelled cars they're trying to come out with. That's what you had right there. You were, in the, you were in the ruts. You had to intentionally get your team to get out of them. He leads me in, the, in these wagon tracks of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of, of death's shadow, whether that means people are threatening me or whether that means I'm, I'm feeling the, the force and the effects of, of aging on this earth, I will fear no evil because in there, even there, he's with me. His rod and his staff, that the tools used to, to keep us in line uh, out of danger and to correct us when we're, when we're intentionally going astray, uh, are a comfort. Even the rod is a comfort when we know that he is with us and for us. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. When, when, when the world, the flesh, and the devil seem to want to destroy me, he feeds me. He provides for me. This is our God with the confidence that we, because of his mercy, his faithfulness to his own covenant, will dwell in the house of the Lord. As the language there is length of days, days without him, days upon days upon days. Ezekiel gives us that kind of a picture of our God and a, and a glorious picture of Jesus, the shepherd, God's shepherd. Okay? Well, that's... that's Summary, quick summary of uh, the prophecy of Ezekiel. Any questions, comments, observations before we wrap this up?